I really do think school is catered to rich people who don't need to work. Obviously, you can work and still do school. It's just so much better when you just have to focus on school. It, it's funny. Um, I was talking to my friends once, and you talk about how playful your young 20s are, you know? And then you reach adulthood, and you're like, what's the signifier of adulthood? And you're like, oh, it's debt for kids in our generation. And my mental health, that sort of scares me the most because I never experienced myself any sort of panic or depression or anxiety. And now I would say there are moments when I, I would say whatever I'm feeling is associated with that. Um, and that's something that I'm not used to. New numbers suggest annual tuition fees at Canadian universities have tripled over the last 20 years and are expected to rise another 13% over the next four. That means your average student will be paying nearly $7,800 a year for tuition. According to the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, Ontario has the highest projected tuition fees, expected to reach almost $9,500. Probably one of the key moments of change in post-secondary education in Canada would have been in 1995 with the Paul Martin budget. He was finance minister under a liberal government at the time. And what happens then is basically 20% of transfers to post-secondary institutions from the federal government are chopped in a single year. So that's where we have the runaway increase of tuition fees. When I was a student at Queen's University in the early to mid-1990s, I could pay my tuition by working in the summer and working part-time during the year. And when I mean part-time, I really mean part-time, like 15 hours a week. Um, today, that's unfathomable. Since school, I started university, I cut down to having school on two days because go train is just so expensive, so cut down to two days. And then I usually work Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Sometimes I'll be working Wednesday, so I don't really have a day off. I feel like this is so pretty. You know, when you come home from work and it's just like, okay, you're gonna like review your notes. You're just gonna look over like your work and then you try, you try to and then, oh, it's four o'clock in the morning and you wake up and you're on like your keyboard on your laptop because you're so tired from like the day, like you don't study, you don't have time to. Like if I didn't have to worry about work, I can definitely take up more of like the help at school that they offer. Like, I keep thinking about all, like, the money that I'm raking up and that I'm going to have to pay, like, when I finish. And that I really just want to get a good paying job so I can finish and, like, pay off my debt so I just don't have it on my back. Like, on top of having school debt, like, I, credit card debt, like, uh, <sighs> So it's just like, yeah, I'm just trying to, how do you even know what I'm trying to do? I don't know what I'm trying to do. I don't know what I'm trying to do. So at times it's like, oh my gosh, the debt is so overwhelming. Yes, I need to find something that's gonna pay me well enough to dig myself out of this hole that my education created for me. Um, but there's other times I say, you know what, it's not, it's not gonna be worth it if I'm just chasing this sort of high paying job. Thankfully, the line's short today. Usually, I'm at the back. <laughs> if I had no debt, if I had no responsibility to pay back for all this education that I'm so uh, sometimes regretting, um, I would have time to 
actually volunteer and actually do things in my community that um, relate to what I'm trying to study, or that I'm trying to research. I would have more time, I, I want to say, to breathe, to, to live, to enjoy my youth, I would say. I am cognizant about my spending. I don't eat out very often, which is unfortunate because there's a lot of fantastic food to be had in Toronto, but it's just outside of my means right now to be eating at, the, at restaurants a lot. So I try to offset my spending a little bit where I can by preparing, making food for myself, eating cheaply at home, a lot of eggs like every college student ever. Kind of platform. A lot of people want it. A lot of people want to use what we have for their own agenda. And actually the day of the solar eclipse in the afternoon, Ryerson called me and was like, someone dropped out of the program and you're at the top of the list, so you've got a spot in the program if you can make it. And you know, at this stage, it's like 10 days till school starts. And I was in Wyoming. Immediately, my life just turned into like <laughs> uh, exactly a complete whirlwind, a complete tornado. I was lucky enough to find a job and I'm able to pick up a couple shifts a week. I'm certainly living within my means right now. I found the cheapest place possible, I'm paying $750. So everything's included. So the most I've ever paid to live anywhere, but it's in the middle of a big city, so I'm not shocked about that, you know? So I had a lot of money saved up coming in from the past couple years in anticipation for going to school. And I thought, if I can at least make enough money to have my rent covered for the time I'm in school and some spending money, that would be great. But I, yes, I'm still going $30,000 into debt. And I'm, I'm confident that I'm going to leave here and that I'm going to be able to make money in the documentary photography industry. So I'm very satisfied with my situation right now. But it is an interesting concept that despite doing all the right things financially, $30,000 in debt is still kind of inescapable. <laughs> so the good news is that more people are seeking post-secondary education than ever before. In Canada, worldwide, amongst big, developed, English-speaking countries has one of the highest rates of participation in post-secondary education in the world. It's almost 70 percent. The problem, however, is because of decades of government cutbacks, at the moment, uh, the conservative estimates that I'm familiar with say that in Canada, by 2012, total student debt was $28 billion, but we think that's actually an underestimated number, but it's a big spike from $19 billion only 13 years before that. You know, on average, we're saying that students um, have accumulated, if you have public and private debt, and a lot of students do have both, you're looking at an average of about $37,000. But even if you're done your education, it serves a very important disciplinary function. It really does. I mean, if you graduate with this, with this debt load, what, what are the chances you're going to go out and um, be a social activist for a year or something before you gain paid employment or work in the nonprofit sector or the voluntary? sector doing activist work, whatever it is. You, you need to start taking on as many jobs as you possibly can in order to pay back the loans so you don't go into arrears, and that follows you for far longer. It's pretty stressful to have collection agencies calling you, so, you know, at, at all hours of the night to try and get you to pay back that debt. So I think maybe part of my reason to go back to school is I still don't know what life holds for me. I don't know what a career path would be, so I thought maybe doing my master's would give me some clarity. And it also helps that when I went back, now OSAP is not hunting me down for money. So when I was in my last year of uh, undergrad, I had taken an extra year 
So I was a part-time student in my last year. So once I did graduate, OSAP started calling me and saying, you owe us. And I said, I thought I had a grace period of six months. And they said, mm, well, that already passed because your grace period started once you became a part-time student. Tell me if you want me to talk or whatever. Tell me if you want me to say something. It really sucks the fact that the jobs that either undergrad students, high school students, or graduate students have to rely on are usually, um, at least from my experience, precarious jobs, low paying jobs. Like I can't even live off of the wages that I make at Rogers Center. I was making up until last year like 12 bucks an hour. Um, and I've been there for the past seven years. Yeah, so we're going to work right now. I'm going to Rogers Center. I need to get every shift that I can. So right now there's holiday shows and Disney on Ice and those sorts of things. So I'll be working from now until the holidays are over. Every single day straight. Christmas, Boxing Day, New Year's Day, all that fun stuff. So I am a shop steward as well, so I sort of help them fix problems whenever the boss acts up or whatever may happen, because it does happen a lot here. Um, it feels good and it, it kind of gives me something to hold on to and I think if it wasn't for that position, I probably wouldn't be as excited to come to work as I usually am. And my fellow ladies, how are you guys? Nice to see you. Yeah. Happy holidays. How are you doing, Alcinero? Happy New Year. That's good. Happy New Year. I'm going to see you inside, okay? I'm coming. Yeah. So, like, I'm sort of like a little lawyer defending people. Lovely ladies like that when shit hits the fan. When the bosses start to treat people like crap. As capitalists usually do. <laughs> We know that our public institutions, our universities and colleges look very different now than they did say 30 or 40 years ago. There's far more uh, of, a, of a corporate commercial presence. There's just, there's more advertising, there's more services available, um, there's more branding. I think increasingly administrators today view students not as students there for a exploratory and contingent process of educational discovery and learning, they see them as customers, you know, bums in the seats, clients that, um, well, that are there for their tuition. People ought to know about the fact that 11 university presidents in the province of Ontario make more than the Prime Minister of Canada. That at Carleton University, if you look at the compensation contract for the president of Carleton University, that person's entitled to a, a home that's paid for by the university uh, with a $3,000 a month housing allowance, a very lavish expense account. Uh, we treat our leaders of universities and colleges as, as if they're celebrities that float around in these bubbles. Schools like run like a business, they don't really run like a school. It is a business, obviously, but I feel like it should be taken into consideration of what students have to go through. There's so many like outside factors and things going on that make uh, your life unhappy or like miserable, and then you come to school and then it just adds on to like the stress, the homework, the studying, the trying to pass, and all the money you're spending, and it's, it's like everything in one. I don't even know how to say it. It's like my mom, my grandma, and like my uncle. So it's like us four in like the house. So it's just like what everyone could do as a collective just to like make it like work. Also like having my little part-time job and still helping to like pay the mortgage. It gets frustrating sometimes. Oh, I said my daily exercise routine is walking up and down like these steps because there's so many. <laughs> so. Uh, midterms, I did bad on my midterms for both my classes. So with that, I've just been going to class and then after class I go to like the tutoring sessions and then sometimes I even go to my professor to ask him extra questions. 
and I've been doing the um, like labs. I just need a 60 in both my classes so, so I can go back on regular probation. If not, I get kicked out for a year and then I have to reapply. I think that's how it goes, so. The pressure is on. So as an international student, we pay around double. So my tuition, the way it works out after some very generous funding from the program, I pay around twelve to $13,000 US per year. When you put that into the context of these types of degrees, I'm paying around a quarter to a fifth of what I would pay for tuition in the United States. I only left undergrad about twelve, thirteen thousand dollars in debt, which is kind of nothing, <laughs> to be honest. Um, some of my friends who chose more expensive schools that did take on all of their student loan debt left a hundred thousand in debt, up to two hundred fifty. So if you imagine your uh, your youth slipping away from you try being 21 years old and being like, holy fuck, I have $240,000 in loan debt. What the hell am I going to do? You know, as documentarians, we are trying to make some sort of an impact on the world. That's our goal. Or we would have gone into a different type of photography. You want to dive right in and make a name for yourself. Start creating good work so that you can get paid for it and get funding, you know? We all want to help people, but we all have to survive, too. You don't want to make minimum payments your whole life until you've racked up however much interest. You want to take care of chunks immediately. So I'm going to have to put my practice on hold and put the projects I really want to do on pause so that I can work on some of this debt. And that is a little uh, troubling, you know? I mean, I can't see an excuse to not have free education and free health care. You know, like, these are basic human rights. The right to knowledge, the right to good health. And I don't think basic human rights should have something as daunting as student debt looming over them. A lot's been discussed about neoliberalism. You could see it as a set of policies, uh, policies like uh, deregulation, privatization, uh, those kinds of things have been happening for a while. You can also see it as kind of a political project as well, uh, uh, and a cultural project where uh, the aims, the purposes of uh, you know, anything in the public realm is supposed to be modified, tweaked, transformed to better serve private interests, uh, and that's exactly what we've been seeing you know, in the universities today, the, the transformation of the universities from a public to a private good. The deception is twofold. So on the one hand, shrinking of the tax burden on the very wealthy in our society, whether they are corporations or individuals, that actually doesn't amount to more prosperity in our society for everyone. It amounts to a, an enormous amount of prosperity for a very small number of people, and that's what we've seen in the last two decades since these ideas and public policy have been pursued in force. So neoliberalism, this fend-for-yourself society that's been sold to people, has been a deception at the level of public policy. It's been a deception at the level of outcome. and. It's, it's been massively profitable for certain people, so no, no surprise, they're continuing to peddle it. Rather than the idea that we collectively have kind of some sort of sense of a common social project and a, a common social infrastructure, uh, instead they focused on the idea that each individual should be responsible for themselves. You're not supposed to care if the kid down the street uh, is able to go to school, right? Uh, so therefore, you, you know, you can have private schools, charter schools, reduce public funding for education, because it doesn't matter. What matters is you, your family and your kid. Uh, and you're not supposed to care about 
the kid down the street. No, again, you're supposed to look out for yourself. You're supposed to be individualized, atomized. You're supposed to be a consumer first, right? Consumer first, a citizen second, right? I think that's one of the things that they've been trying to drill into people's heads for a long time. Um, look out for yourself. So as soon as I graduated from undergrad is when I started taking care of my um, sick relative. And at first it was thought to be a temporary thing. I would just sort of move in with him for a few months until he was adjusted with his new lifestyle. And um, it so happens it's been about two years now. And it doesn't look like his condition is getting any better. How's it going, Uncle? Yeah, Ma. Okay, come. You put on your leg properly? Mm -hmm. Okay, come. My plan in terms of last year just kind of changed because um, OSAP decided not to pay me because they've decided that I'm on academic probation. I called them and they kept calling them because I'm like, the, the semester is almost over. So what's happening with my money? I'm basically drowning and um, Finally, I got a hold of somebody and they said, you're not getting anything because when I was in my last year of undergrad, I um, was not enrolled as a full-time student and I'm kind of stuck. I'm in a limbo because they're trying to work it out on their end, as they've said, and um, at the same time, the bills are piling, right? So I had to go back to my old union job. So, although I'm working full-time with the union, I am also observing it as though I was doing an independent um, research study course. So, luckily, I worked it out so I don't have to completely drop out or take a leave of absence or something. Let's see what happens at the end of the semester if I survive once I start doing actual writing. <laughs> What's that red light on you? It's a bomb. <laughs> I'm sort of crossing bridges as I go, I'm not trying to think too, too far ahead, because then I'll really go into another depression <laughs> if I try to sort everything out. So. I think it's just the, wa the walk-in. It's just the walk-in. So I checked my marks while I was at work, and I passed my one class, but I failed my test. But like all the other work and stuff I did, I still passed that class. And then I failed my finance exam. So today I basically figured out like, I don't think I'm going to pass the semester. After all the bullshit, after all the drama, I couldn't even pull it together to get my marks. So that's really annoying. I was just at work like crying, and stuff like having like a panic attack and like breakdown. Like I don't know what to like do next. So once I saw that those marks, I emailed like my one professor about um, what happened with my, my job and stuff and how I couldn't come to school to um, do the SPS. So like if he can like please like allow me to do it over. Like if I can do it over and get a better mark, it can help. But even with that, I think I just came to the conclusion that with how bad my finance mark is that. Like, I'm not going to make it, so it's just annoying. I don't know. I was like, should I switch my program? Like, I can't fucking pass finance. Like, should I switch my program? What am I supposed to do? Like, how am I supposed to continue on? Like, how am I supposed to be, like, a businesswoman and go into business? And, like, I can't even pass finance. I don't know. One of the things that I've been very uh, pleased to see is a lot of what's happening in the student movements. I remember reading about the student movement in Ch Chile. And that's been happening around the world. I mean, you look what 
happened in Quebec. The Red Uprising in Quebec, the you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of students who participated in uh, basically a boycott of the university for, for a while, um, massive demonstrations. But one of the great things about that uprising, and it's not talked about enough, is that they weren't just talking about tuition. They started off talking about tuition, right? That was their main focus. Ended up talking about poverty, you know, corporate power, neoliberalism, climate change, um, and how all of this stuff, all the social problems that we're experiencing are related. Just have to keep getting louder! students for free post-secondary education. I think that the most exciting thing in terms of talking about tuition fees and the potential of free tuition is exactly the question of how it might happen. I think the good thing is that the way it has to happen is that students need to mobilize in new ways and take control over their destinies and begin to say uh, we won't do this anymore. And when you look at all the great social gains that have happened, it's happened because people have gotten together and fought for it. And I think students have to organize in new ways to transform the institutions that they study in and to transform society as a whole. I think students and their families should be thinking about how we can become that fearsome contingent to stand up to the elite and say enough is enough. You know, enough is enough. We're not going to pay for your gravy train anymore. We're not going to buy your bill of goods anymore. Stop making money off of us. We're not your consumers. We are people. And we are people that have passions and dreams. And what I see standing in their way are a bunch of entitled, privileged people who have been living high off the hog for too long. Enjoying life and helping others is the main goal of good people in this world. And debt does hinder both those things, really. Once I graduate from Ryerson, I'd like to put my college diploma up and my Ryerson bachelor's up side by side to be like, this is when I graduated college and this is when I graduated um, university as like my accomplishments. It turned into not, not wanting some sort of nine to five office job with stability and uh, you know, a long-term financial gain. It, it's not about that anymore. It's really about just enjoying what I'm doing and making sure that that's um, helping others in whatever sense that may be.
to be one of those people that's like 35, 40, still paying off their school debt, which makes it a little